Here's the big question on episode one of season five is that have you ever felt overwhelmed by all the complexities? It feels like the world is getting more complex. Our businesses are getting more complex. Everything is just becoming more complex. And uh, today I'm going to delve a little bit into how we can really change that and how we can really change our lives through one simple thing by simplifying. And uh, we're going to look at five different aspects of the business. They're definitely not the only five, but we're going to get into five of them to share with you what you can do there and just maybe how you can start thinking differently about those areas. And uh, we're going to touch on a load of things. So with that, let's cue the new intro. Here we go. Good morning, good morning, good morning. I hope I can still do this. This has been a while. Uh, I think uh, just about two months since we've been on air. So thank you very much for joining us live this morning. And if you're obviously watching this on demand, uh, then thank you very much for spending time with us, with us as well. But he hectically excited. Uh, that's a word that ChatGPT would not come up with if it were to write the script, <laughs> because there is no script. Uh, but uh, really excited for being back for season five. And we have loads in store for you this season. New format, new hosts, new branding, new music. But very familiar. So we said, look, that's very much the same as last year, but so different. So hopefully I'm keen to hear what you think about the new show format and uh, everything else that we've done to level up and raise the bar for the show. But uh, as you will see, we have new hosts. We've uh, put out some things on social media and so on so that everybody could see that uh, there's plenty more hosts. So we've got that means we've got more segments. Uh, still the same format during the show. I'll, I'll quickly run you through that. But uh, we've got more people. So there's more variety. There's more input. There's more people to learn from. There's more experiences. Uh, everything is just more, 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 more. And that's really what it is about. So uh, warm welcome back to Season 5. And happy with uh, everyone that's here with us this morning. Right, so... Uh, I'm glad to say that uh, we're still doing current affairs with the Financial Planning Institute. And this morning, Lalani is here to uh, take us through the latest news. Then we have Razan back with, uh, oh, almost said with Pro for me. Uh, Razan is back with Brandworks. Uh, see, I'm a little bit rusty. And uh, she's going to talk this morning about networking's future. So that's going to be very interesting. And then also we have David Cobb basically making a return to the show because he used to be part of the FBI and he was a regular on season two and three. And then sort of uh, had to go and do other things. So uh, David is back and he's uh, hosting his own new segment called Bulletproof Your Business. And today he's talking about business management versus practice management. So looking forward to that. I've got a couple of announcements and then we get into the topic of simplifying. But this would not be a show, a live show, if we are not saying hi to everybody. So good morning, Halloween's in first this morning. So very nice to see you. Johan Basson, good morning. Uh, nice to see you, Johan Piens. Uh, I hope I'm saying that right. Is it peens or peens? I'm not sure. Like, I come for the Friday start off, so please do excuse me. Anton Skitte, goeiemorgen, mense. Lekker, nice to see you. Ferdi van die Kerk, good morning, Ferdi. Nice to see you as well. Uh, I'm also saying just good morning on screen there. Kovis Klein, good morning, good morning. Uh, saying that the withdrawal symptoms can now go away. Dank jy toch. Uh, Liana, good morning, goeiemorgen. Uh, nice to see you as well. Neil Phillips is here. Good morning, Neil. Nice to see you. Joseph is back. Good morning. Lizette, I saw you yesterday. Good morning. Nice to see you here as well. Uh, and then Lene is also saying hi and welcome back to everybody. Laka. Stephen, good morning. Nice to see you. And then we've got Vuledzani in the house. Good morning, Vuledzani. Nice to see you. Uh, Wayne Bantam, mou mater. Goeiemorgen. Francis, ali pat van die ooste. Goeiemorgen. <laughs> Nice. Mr. Ted and Stoven himself, good morning, good morning. Barry for Nikar, good morning. Thank you very much for being here with us this morning. Arun, good morning, and thank you for your message saying hi this morning. Uh, Johan Potgitter, good morning. Nice to see you as well. Uh, Dr. Defaru, it's been a while. Sure, it feels like ages. Good morning, good morning. Frank Agliotti, saw you in the week. Good morning. Nice to see you, Mary. Uh, hope you're doing fantastically well. Uh, we've got Nico van Wijk, good morning. Goeiemorgen. 
Um, and <laughs> I was saying great new hairstyle. Purpose, this is because my straightener isn't working anymore. <laughs> so it's a forced new hairstyle. That's the universe's way. Um, Tina's Brits, good morning. Goeiemorgen. Adrian, goeiemorgen. Sorry if I start running through this a little bit uh, quicker. There's so many people here. Good morning, uh, Yashil. Nice to see you. Jonathan Tennyson. Wow. Jonathan, I hope this is not the first time, but if it's the first time you're saying hi, good morning. I hope you're doing well. Marky, hope you're doing well where you are. Uh, Zanele, good morning. Nice to see you as well. Renee, uh, Daisy's here, and Russell rounds it out. And on that note, goeie genade. Lelani, I hope you're ready, because here we go with the first news for 2024. Yes, good morning, Francho. I love the new music. I'm driving here in my office and the staff walking past the glass windows is thinking uh, Lalani must be in a good mood. Um, quickly, Francho, a special shout out to all the FPI members online, the volunteers, and we've got a few board members online, so no pressure. Um, but welcome, everybody, to the 2nd of February, and it's Barbara Mundell's birthday today. For those who know her, Happy birthday, Barbara. So if we quickly look at the update on the two-pot system, yes, it's an update on the two-pot system again, but it's important that we know what's going on with the two-component system. So the Minister of Finance, Enoch Gondongwana, has published a much-anticipated pension funds amendment bill, which uh, would see the implementation of the two-component retirement system. Now, he introduced the bill in National Assembly on January the 30th this year, um, and it's expected to be finalized by the end of March this year. Let's be clear on that. So the purpose for those who, who maybe forgot what it is all about uh, is to amend the Pension Funds Act and to insert certain definitions to provide for the introductions of the uh, savings withdrawal benefit, um, the appropriate account of a member's interest in the savings, retirement and vested components. There's three parts. Some say there's 100. Anyway, there's three. And deductions that may be made. It is expected that the two-part system will take place and effect the 1st of September. So do take note, it's 1st of September 2024. However, very important, we are still awaiting the amendment of the Income Tax Act by the Revenue Laws Amendment Act. Then the Standing Committee on Finance, otherwise known as ESCOF, is set to meet on February the 6th to receive a briefing by National Treasury on the Pensions Bill. And then additionally, there is further meetings that scheduled for the ESCOF on the 12th, 19th and 26th of March. Now, these are public hearings, so please do note you can register for it. You can just go to their website and ask to be registered. It's not automatically. There's somebody who, who vets you and, and you may or may not receive a link, but it's public. Um, and um, that is to allow for National Treasury and the possible consideration of the adoption of ESCOF's report on, on, on this. Then let's quickly scoot into crypto. So what's happening in the crypto world? For those who didn't have a good storybook or something to read over December, January, there was a very good report published by the Financial Sector Conduct Authority on crypto assets. Um, so they did a crypto South Africa crypto assets market study. And if you missed it, it is on their website. It's on one of those rolling banners that you see. And they won uh, an award for one of the best employers for the year. So congratulations to the Financial Sector Conduct Authority. Now, in summary, the interesting finding is almost all crypto assets financial services providers claim to disclose the risk related to crypto asset activities to the consumers and to the public at large. Cape Town leads the way um, in terms of the head office location. The results be testimony to the fact that Cape Town is considered to be the largest technology hub in Africa. So the majority of the crypto asset FSPs earn their revenue from trading fees, and most of the remuneration models identify mirror traditional financial revenue um, models. The majority of crypto assets financial services providers have interventions in place to handle complaints, However, these interventions will need to be coordinated with the management and processing of complaints related to the treating customers fairly or the TCF outcomes. More than half of the crypto assets um, for FSPs have built their businesses around retail customers and understanding the extent, extent of retail participation over time will be critical in assessing the consumer protection risk and impact on this market. 
Then we have a Wacky Wednesday, we have a Pensioner Wednesday, and are also Warning Wednesdays. So what is Warning Wednesday all about? Well, that is the FSCA that publishes warnings and alerts um, mostly on Wednesdays. Now, just quickly, and last year, which is 2023, they issued 78 warnings and alerts. And this year, they've already issued six alerts. It is on their website. Now, all six the, uh, warnings relates to scams with strange names like Triple M Crypto with a K. So sometimes it's in the name already. We urge all financial advisors and planners to keep on warning your clients. Shortly, there was an ombudsman determination as well, a phase ombudsman determination that came out on the 1st of February by advocate John Simpson. And the long of the short is a brokerage was ordered to pay a medical doctor about 300,000 rand after the insurer rejected her claim the, following the theft of her Toyota Land Cruiser. It would appear that the brokerage is held liable by the ombud as the client was not told that she needed to install the tracking device in her vehicle. This is an age-old type of ruling that comes out. Um, let's see what happens if the FSP is going to appeal or not. High level from the FBI, first PCE is being written the 8th and the 9th of February. That's the professional competency examination. Special shout out to the students and can at all the candidates. Good luck and to Nikki McDonald and her team, Stan Stark. We hope that the load shedding schedule um, will be forever in your favor. Lastly, if you're not registered for the annual refresher, please do so. Our speakers are Vessel Oosthuizen, Errol Mayer, Andrew Bradley, and Lalani Besay Note. We are in Cape Town the 27th of February, Durban 29th of February, Skrikkeljaar, um, or Leap Year, and Gauteng and Midrand on the 5th of March. If you missed any of the sessions, the online session is the 27th of March. With that, Francia, back to you in the studio wherever you are. Cheers. Thank you very much, Lani. And uh, yeah, a jam-packed first current affairs session there. Thank you very much uh, for the input. And then next up, we have Razan Westeisen uh, with her segment on Brandworks and talking about networking's future. Just give me a second. There is a technical glitch. Just called one second. Sorry for that. Razan, don't worry. <laughs> it's all happening. There we go. Hey, we're back fresh. Live television, as Adam always say. Uh, so here we go. Uh, thank you very much for your patience, Razan. Here we go. Good morning and a warm welcome to another season of Brandworks brought to you by ProfileMe. Today, we're going to leap into networking's future where modern technology driven introductions becomes the new unforgettable. Now, when it comes to effective networking, remember there are a few essentials. One, it must be memorable. Two, it must have purpose. Three, ease of information exchange. And four, there must be a follow up action. Making an introduction memorable isn't just about what you say, it's about how you say it. And some really incredible mechanisms that have come to the forefront are with, a, with a wow factor are NFC cards and QR codes. Now these really are the new age business cards. Imagine tapping a card or scanning a code to share your entire professional portfolio in a single link. They're not just convenient, they're a statement that is memorable about embracing technology and innovation. So first up, we have the NFC card or the near field communication card. This is your professional handshake in the digital area. With a single tap, you transmit not just your name, but your entire story to a phone that is in the person's hand next to you. And you can get them in variable forms from metal to plastic and even bamboo. All you have to do is tap, a link will pop up and that will go to wherever you're sending the person online. Now you also get NFC tags or stickers, round little stickers like this. These can also be coded with a link and you can stick this on almost anything. You can stick it on your person and you can say tap me and you can stick it on a gift 
that you give somebody to take away. The possibilities with NFC really is endless. Now, you might wonder, what does this cost? Well, it's a little bit of a pricey co initial cost outlay for the cards. Um, its convenience is in the fact that it's reusable and it eliminates the need to keep printing paper business cards. You'd be looking to spend around about anything from a thousand rand if you're using a overseas supplier and also depending on the material that you choose to around about 590 if you're going to be looking locally. Um, on the heels of NFC is the good old QR code. By now we all know how these look and work just like the NFC, you scan it and it goes to a link. So I rather want to share a few interesting stats about the QR code. The pandemic significantly boosted QR code usage worldwide. We all know this. Uh, a 2021 survey found that QR code downloads had increased by over 750% over a period of 18 months in that time. And research indicates that QR codes have a high engagement rate, with one study showing that scanning rates can reach up to 85% for certain campaigns. Now, a few hacks that I recommend with QR codes it's always make sure they have a logo on them or even better your profile picture printed on them so the person that receives them know exactly what you look like attach them to something that's a conversation starter or something that's easy to keep on your person so it's easy to carry around but it's hard to throw away that might be a pen or that's a little bit more on the pricier range whatever it may be but you can attach them to something then lastly, make them tappable. By adding a tag to this, you now have dual purpose, tap and scan QR codes. Now, as I said, uh, when you tap and when you scan, this goes to a link that's online. Um, where do these digital pathways lead to? Um, it could be your personal website. It could be your profile me page. It could be, for instance, a valuable PDF resource that you've spoken about in the interaction that you would, that you said, I will give you this resource. Um, it could go to a form where you capture valuable information about the interaction and what the follow-up action is. It can go to your LinkedIn page. It's really, if there's a link online, you can make people in the, the physical presence go to, to, to that online. It's all about creating a digital ecosystem that resonates with your brand and also provides immediate value. The possibilities really are endless. Now, as we navigate the modern networking landscape, look to tools like NFCs and QR code codes that are more, more than just gimmicks. They are essentials for making lasting impressions in the future of networking. And that's it from me today. If you have any questions, feel free to give me a shout at razan.com. And I hope you all have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you very much, Razan. It's already starting to get difficult to, to top the next episode that's coming up to top this one. Uh, so thank you very much for those insights. It's practical. It's very valuable. So thank you very much for sharing all of that. Next up, ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome back Mr. David Kopp. Uh, and, and he is talking about business management versus practice management in his segment, Bulletproof Your Business. Uh, good morning, everyone, and uh, it's uh, great to be back on the show and, and dealing with a new segment, Bulletproof Your Business. So are you a business owner, director, or manager in a financial planning business? Over the season, we'll be looking at various business management topics, such as strategy. Bulletproof Your Business has been deliberately chosen rather than Bulletproof Your Practice. And why is this? What is the difference between business management and practice management? Well, business management takes a holistic approach looking at the organization as a whole. It focuses on making strategic decisions, managing resources, and overseeing functions for long-term objectives. Practice management puts a strong emphasis on meeting the needs and expectations of clients. It involves client communication, satisfaction, 
and the quality of services provided, like what does your advice process look like? Well, business management and practice management may seem similar. It is like doing a holistic financial plan versus a single need. Business management starts with a holistic, enduring strategy that will see your business succeed no matter the scenarios that you find yourself in. Practice management we see as a subset of business management, while equally important, it focuses on the particular area of how your client engagement and your client factors look rather than the business as a whole. So what is the key from moving from practicing to running a business? Well, the first thing is a mindset change. You're not a financial planner who owns a business, but a business owner who offers financial planning and advice services. When you understand that you are in the business of running a business, you will need to then look at what role do I play in this business? And I'm going to borrow from the e-myth here where it looks at, are you the entrepreneur, the manager, or the technician? If your passion is sitting in front of clients and not dealing with the tea and toilet issues of running a business, then you need to consider bringing someone in who can do the business management stuff. This can either be on an outsource basis or somebody who you employ in-house to handle that side of it. When we look at business management, it includes things like getting intentional about your strategy. And yes, a little secret. Even if you think you don't have a strategy, you have one. Okay, You may not know about it, and by luck, you might have just fallen into it. So part of it is sitting down and saying, how do you get intentional about your business strategy? Considering the people you have in the business, are they the right people to implement your strategic vision as a business owner? Consider your resources. Are they sufficient to meet the objectives of your strategy? Consider the leadership that you have in your business. Is it the right leadership driving the business to where you want to head? And lastly, considering what your processes look like. Are you allocating your resources correctly to drive your strategic vision? So that's just a little insight into what business management versus practice management looks like. And we hope to unpack these topics uh, during this season. Now, I couldn't end off just there. I have to give you my bright thoughts for the week. Okay, so why do we always face the same side of the moon? Well, here on Earth, we can always see the man in the moon because the same surface faces towards us no matter the moon's orbit. That is because the moon is tightly locked with Earth, meaning that our gravitational pull keeps us rotating at an axis on its speed that is coordinated with the orbit around the planet. Humans didn't get a look at the moon's other side until 1959, when the Soviet lunar spacecraft took photos, and scientists realize it's much different. There are a few lava seas, like the ones facing us, and more, more impact craters. So with that note, Francois, back to you in the studio. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, David. Amazing stuff. Welcome back. Uh, and really jealous of that nice Lego uh, collection there at the back. So well done. Uh, thank you very much. Then next up, just a couple of quick announcements. Maybe more than a couple today, but uh, quick announcements. Here we go. Righty, right. So first of all, let me just talk a little bit about the show. Um, and here you can see all the people who will be uh, hosting some of the segments uh, that we are doing. So you obviously have already seen Lilani and you've seen David, you've seen Razan. Norma will be back. So don't stress for those of you worrying, where's Norma? She's in the crowd today. So uh, I saw she said hello. Uh, but Norma's going to be back with her segment. Uh, Nikki will also come, uh, you know, she and uh, Lilani, they sort of take turns. Quibus is back with a brand new segment called um, The Advisor's Path. We have Kim Potgieter, who's also uh, going to be delivering a segment called Wellbeing and Money. Uh, then myself will be all over the place as usual. Tanya is back. I'm so glad that Tanya joined us for this uh, on value-driven advice. And then, of course, there in the corner uh, is not where you put baby, but that's where Ichno is at the moment. So Ichno is back as well with Change Your Angle. And uh, the way that we're going to do this uh, this year is that the sort of we're taking like a four week cycle. So uh, a couple of things. So current affairs is going to be every week. Then we have the two different segments. Every week is going to be two different segments. And then also uh, from my end for the main segment, we're going to be doing one monologue like today, 
one interview, a panel discussion the next week, and then another interview, and then we start again. So you can really look forward to a variety of content, but also dynamic uh, structures and dynamic sort of ways that we do things so that you don't get bored with the same thing over and over and over again. So we're really trying to mix that up. And then also on that note, if you know of anybody that you think will be a great host for a five-minute segment, please do let me know. I would really like, if you are interested, let me know. Um, we'll be very happy to, to talk to you. Righty, so the most important thing to talk about uh, is Propulsion Tech. So Propulsion Tech is happening on the 9th, 11th, and 16th of April. Uh, so this is an event that we started last year. So this will be the second year that we run this. And the whole idea here is to showcase technology for the financial planning profession and industry and everything uh, in between. So it's all focused on what you do on a daily basis, the businesses you run. So it doesn't matter whether you're in corporate or whether you're in your own uh, business or you may be building a practice within another business, this is something that you want to see. It's not only the showcases, so there's going to be live demos. We've got 18 different product providers that are going to showcase their products live to you, 20 minutes, 20 minutes at a time. And then we also have incredible keynote speakers like Johan Stein. He's going to be talking on artificial intelligence. And if you haven't seen him on LinkedIn, go, go look him up. Uh, and then also Panos Leladakis is also going to join us for a keynote. So really happy about that. And then also we have uh, other keynote speakers in between that I will uh, announce as we go through. And then uh, we have some panel discussions. And uh, the one panel discussion that I just want to highlight for today is on how do you stay compliant in a rapidly changing world uh, because of tech and AI. So there we've got Lalani is on that panel. We've got Anton Swanepoel. I've got Charmaine van Wyk and Bulizani is going to be the facilitator for that. So really looking forward to a powerful 45-minute discussion there. And then we have some incredible practical things and fun things that we also throw in. So uh, we're going to do uh, show you how to build a virtual agent. We are going to do a prompting shootout and as well as a financial planning showdown. So we are going to look at, uh, you know, just for a little bit of fun. And then uh, last but not least, you also have the ability to engage with all of the sponsors and product providers directly during the event. And we've shortened it. So it's three mornings. It's not the full day. So don't worry. It's not three full days. It's just three mornings that you can spend with us and we've applied for CPD and all of that good stuff. So as soon as we know how much uh, points we got for you, we will announce that as well. But that's a bonus. So go check it out. Um, it's on the website, propulsion.co.za and uh, go and get your tickets right now. If you jump before the end of February, then there is a special code there where you can get 20% discount, but everything is in the emails that we've sent as well as on the website. All right, so that's that. Then uh, on the 23rd of April, we're hosting our first day of CPD. So we're going to do this quarterly, again, just for the morning. So you're looking at, I don't know how many points. Uh, we're still busy with the agenda, um, but you'll be able to do this. And just by the way, so both the Propulsion Tech event and the day of CPD is free for our members to attend. It's included in their membership. And uh, so members, please don't go and purchase anything. Um, you, I'll, I will show you how to register. But the day of CPD, it's practical. It's aimed at things that really add value. It's not fluff. Uh, we don't do fluff. We don't believe in fluff. And uh, so look out for that. We'll send out more information. We haven't sent out any information on this, but I just wanted to give you sort of a heads up. Then very importantly, so uh, as you know, in Propulsion last year, we did a Microsoft 365 Champion Certificate, which was a six-week program where we delved into different aspects of Microsoft to help you get the most out of Microsoft. Well, the next session that we're doing sort of in that train is going to be on nothing else than Copilot. And we've got the absolute, absolute person, the best person I could find for this, and that's Katie. Uh, she's gonna, she's been using Copilot for the last year, specifically in financial planning and financial services. So we're going to look at five different use cases in this session. Uh, this is taking place on the 8th of February. This is only for members. So if you're not a member, go check out Propulsion, go to our website and go see what we're about. Uh, but we are running that. Uh, and then there's quite a few other things that we are running as well. Then we had our kickoff event uh, this week on Wednesday and we launched a lot of stuff. Uh, obviously, some of the things you just saw, uh, but there's a whole bunch of other things that we launched that's coming and that's going to be available to members. And uh, just so that you know about that. But the one thing that I do want to highlight just very briefly from that event is the propeller awards that we so propeller some people we even used it in the logo like a little propeller but uh, it's really about you know it sort of plays on the propulsion theme and it is about 
recognizing those people that are part of propulsion that really makes makes a difference and that really contributes and uh, is is a is an active part of the community. So the first winner for ambassador of the year. So this is the person who can't stop talking about propulsion, and that was none other than Mr. Mark Weston Ford. So Mark, thank you very much for that. And then our volunteer of the year, uh, and and the reason why. So so the volunteer of the year is one thing where we look outside of the community. We don't just look in the community, whereas all the others are are, are just in the community. Um, so we also then uh, looked at that, and uh, Norma Simons uh, won that. And the simple reason is that, you know, since season two of the show, not even a bug could keep her away from doing her segment. And she's contributed so much to the community through challenges and other programs and things that she ran. And uh, it's been absolutely amazing to have a part of this. So thank you, Norma. Then Mr. Des Trahile, uh, emphasis wealth advisory. Uh, the emphasis here is definitely on Des. Uh, he's the most engaged member of the year. Uh, he did double what the next person did in terms of attending but also engaging during sessions, asking questions, uh, you know, looking at other things that we did on the platform. So he's really been taking the most advantage of, of what he got. Uh, so thank you very much for that, Des, your true inspiration. Then a community is nothing if we don't help each other, right? It's about supporting and all of that. And there the winner was nominated and voted for by the members. And uh, glad to say that Kuba Klein won that one for most helpful member of the year. So it's all about somebody who just gives their time and they always offer. You don't even always have to ask. They just say, I'll help, come and talk to me or, or whatever it is. And there's lots that happen off of that. Then the last award that we also um, gave was on the propulsion knee of the year. So this is somebody that embodies everything that we stand for, uh, you know, not just in the community, but outside and what they're doing for the profession and sort of how they show up and what they do for like the whole thing, right? The whole package. And there, this was also voted for by members, according to them. And according to them, Mr. Terence Tobin won that award. So well done, Terence, and thank you very much for everything that you do for the profession. All righty. So that's sort of all of those good things. So uh, thank you very much for listening to that. And then next up, I'm going to talk about simplifying just about everything in your business. Although I'm just going to look at five things. But the concept is the more we can simplify the better we'll be off. So let's do, do that. So something that I've definitely noticed over many, many years now is how just how complex things have gotten. I think it all started off way back, you know, when all we knew were like, if, if you went independent, the biggest reason why you went independent was not because you wanted freedom. It was not because you wanted to build your own business. It's because you wanted to offer more choice. And because of that, we got to the point where we have contracts with just about everybody. Uh, we have clients with products just about everywhere. Uh, or at least there's a section of your clients that, that has gone there. So, you know, that part of it has become very, very complex. Then regulations have evolved quite considerably. You think about the good old days when I started in 1998, when there were no things, basically. 1998, what, what happened then? I think it was the, what did they call it? Like, was it PPL? I can't remember, but the Policyholder Protection Rules, PPR, I think it was called. Um, so that came in, and that was that to be included in your quotes and all sorts of, and that was like, oh, what's happening? Then 2004 came around and phase was introduced. And since then, I mean, I don't have to tell you what has happened since then, but it's it's, it's, it's brought a new level of complexity and requirements and, and things like that. And now with, with Kofi that's coming, obviously we're moving from, I can tick a box to say I did it to, can I show that I did it? Um, so it's outcomes based and principles based. So it's a completely different new way that's staring us in the face and having to be able to showcase what I've, or, or prove that I've, what I've done and that we're actually helping the client achieve the outcomes that they were looking for. It's a new level of, of complexity. So complexity is all around us. It is unfortunately part of the of the game. Uh, it also makes it fun, I believe, and, and make sure that we don't get bored. Um, but the one thing that I realized, and the more I think about this, and I've seen some people do it, right? So that's obviously the things that are prompting it, uh, sort of what are people doing? But also in my own business, although we don't give advice, I don't have an advice practice, but even in our world, things have gotten complex very, very quickly because we want to over-engineer things and we want to overthink these processes and all of them. So my old theme for the year 
there's sort of two words that play. And the one is my wife's word, I think, and the other one is, is more mine. But mine is the simplicity. So I want to simplify everything. And, and where this came from is all the conversations we had at the end of last year where people look at their technology and we look at their technology and they just have like a gazillion apps and things that they pay for. And it's doing this here and doing that there and doing that over there. And then you feel like this is unnecessary. I'm sure that we can simplify things, that we can come up with what is the smallest tech stack that you can do a good job with. So that's sort of where it, what, what prompted the, the, the thinking initially. And then obviously went to like, whoa, but the whole business needs to, needs to simplify. Or everything in your life actually needs to simplify. The other word is being intentional. Because if you're not going to be intentional, then you're not going to get results. Because the intentionality means that your actions are aligned with what it is that you're trying to achieve. It's aligned with your values. It's, everything is aligned. So when you're intentional, in, in my view anyway. So for me, that is really what it's about. And when we simplify, we greatly enhance the success of our businesses. And I'll share with you just a little bit uh, about why I, I say that. So just think about everybody that plays a role in your business, right? So if we simplify things for the client, it's easy to understand. For your team, easy to learn, easy to execute. For you, easy to focus on just the things that you need to focus on. So just think of just about those things, right? There's, there's plenty more that we can, we can think of. But if we just think about those, we definitely can see that, well, this – this is that these are, this have great, great, great benefits. So the first aspect of the business that I want to talk about is the thing that I started off with, which is the financial products that you offer as part of your value proposition or, or whatever it may be. Now, it might be that you work within a space where you only um, look at one product provider, but even though you have one product provider, that product provider has multiple products. And it's not only, oh, they have a risk product, an investment product, and, and whatever. They have multiple investment products and multiple risk products, right? Just think about medical aid. Multiple options that you need to keep on top of. Now, multiply that by saying, well, now I have got five other contracts where that is also the case. I mean, it is literally overwhelming for you. It's overwhelming for the clients. It leads to decision fatigue. Right. It's just how do you make a decision? And then you try and stay on top of all these things. And at this place, you've got a BC, but that you don't have a BC because you're not supporting them. But you have clients who need like I don't need to tell you about all of those. And also, the more of these product offerings that you offer and the more contracts you have, the more people want to talk to you. In other words, taking up your time. So there's a lot to consider here when it comes to that. And we need to be very, very clear. So if we can, if we can streamline what we offer. Decide who's your main investment provider and maybe have a second one. Who's your main risk provider? Maybe have a second and a third one. But you don't need six, right? So those are the kind of things where you need to start thinking. Now, depending on how big your business is, because the bigger the business, the more you're going to need, because now you need to serve the advisors within your business, and they need to be able to choose which ones they want to focus on. But ultimately, when you're a smaller business, if you want to simplify, you've got to think about because now just think about investments, right? So now they're sitting all over the place. How do I report on those? How do I keep on top of it? I'm not even talking about staying up to date with the funds and all of those good things. But how do I stay on top of just the things where I put my clients? But if everything's on one platform, everything becomes simpler. The reporting, the information, uh, the service, like everything gets enhanced the more you put into one place. So, and that's what I'm saying. It's not investing everybody's money the same. Remember, this show is not about advice. The show is about thinking about your business and systems and processes and all the other things that are linked to that. So that's what we want to want to talk about. For you to stay on top, to become a real expert in some of those things, you know, it's going to be so much easier because you focus on on the things that you focus on. Now, obviously, what we do is not all about product. Uh, product seems to be has definitely shifted to the end of the of the line, and it is one of the last things that we do. There's a lot of other things we do. Um, so I, and I think the fact that we that we've done that and that this is where things are moving to is exactly the reason why you should simplify. Because your valid proposition is not only uh, anymore to find the best product and the best benefit. Um, you know, I, I recently saw a thing. I was at a coffee shop and there was a QR code to scan talking about QR codes, and it takes me to a page where it says, you know. Um, uh, don't wait, I won't waste your time. I won't do this. I won't do that. All I'll do is a like for like quote. Um, and that's it. And I'll pay for the coffee. I'm like, is that what financial advice is about? I know we all got to start somewhere, but really 
Like if that is still the value proposition, then any of the things I'm telling you now is not going to work for you. So then, then um, you know, th there's no value here. But if you're doing all these other things in your business where you're really focusing on the client first and it's all about their dreams, their hopes, their fears, and you focus on the person and the person is the client and not their money, then you can definitely look at simplifying your product offering. So just think about do you have a strategy or a criteria or a, something that you go through of how do you select a product provider for the different needs of your clients? And then say, well, who's the top one? And maybe go to have a look at your existing book and see where have I put most clients? Because it will be that you'll have a favorite anyway, right? So most of the clients are already with one of them. So maybe that's the one that you should go with. Um, and, uh, and and those things. So I'm not going to get into due diligence and all of those those things that you need to do and figure out, you know, is this still the best thing to do for your clients and all of that. That goes without saying. But we, what we want to do is we want to make it simpler for you to make recommendations. We want to make it simpler for the client to make a, a choice. And we just want to be more efficient and have stronger relationships with clients and providers so that things can happen faster. Um, so that's a big part of simplifying um, your world, if I may. It's if we look at the product offerings. Right. So the second thing I want to talk about that we can look at is and this is sort of counterintuitive for many people, is your client book versus your ideal client profile. And this is not just about, oh, do I is this really my ideal client profile? Do I need to access other markets? It's not about that. What it's really about is that maybe you're sitting with a thousand clients. And some of you will have the infrastructure and the systems and the processes to be able to really look well after those thousand clients. Other people will not have the ability to do that. So if you find it difficult to get to all the clients, then definitely one of the things you want to look at, say, well, you know, if I do a deep dive data analysis and someone like Liana can help you with that, but if there's a deep dive you want to do and see where things are happening at the moment, who is really bringing in the business in, uh, in or the revenue in your business, who are the people with whom you really have a relationship, not somebody you know and see once a year, somebody, sometimes maybe twice, uh, you know, once every two years. It's somebody that you have a close relationship with, that you really know well, that you spend a lot of time with. Those are the clients. And I'm betting that that's a small portion of your client base. Yet we want to hang on to the rest. The reason is that there's safety in numbers. And we're always like, but what if they come into money? What if they inherit? What if they refer someone to me? What if, whatever, I don't know, win the lotto. So we hang on to them. Of course, maybe, maybe, maybe one day. But then typically the latter part of your client base are the ones who's not bringing in revenue, but they're also the ones who keep you the busiest because they are probably not busy. You know, when you have a, a, a client with whom you've got a good relationship with, it's it's worth it to look after them and uh, they're busy. There's a reason why they're doing well. You know, people that are not doing well are probably not busy. I'm not talking about busy for busy, busyness sake. But those are the kind of things that we need to think about. And at the very least, do a data analysis on your book to understand your book and then let that lead you to answers. You don't have to listen to me. The most important thing is go look at the data, do the analysis, get everything together. The things you'll need is obviously the demographical data. You'll need revenue data. You'll need product data. You will need um, assets under management data, right? So I think those are probably the main ones, right? And if you have other qualitative information, you can overlay that on top of that as well. But I would say that that's the minimum data that you would need to do a proper um, analysis. So start thinking about that and then see whether from that you can create an ideal client profile to say, well, these are the people I tend to work with best. And then the big step to come, if you want to simplify, it's not just understanding. It's actually about starting to hand off some of those clients to other advisors in your business or to employ somebody who can take them over. So it's not that you have to get rid of them out of your business unless you don't want to bring somebody in your business. Because the thing that we've seen is the most difficult for people is to bring someone into their business. And, this, and then the even more difficult thing is to hand clients off to them. Like just people just can't do that. So the intention is there. But when it comes to the action part, we, we really battle with that. But if you want to simplify your life, want to simplify your business, that is a big starting point uh, that you need to, need to think about. The next one is regulation and compliance and all that good stuff. The one thing we know is that it doesn't stop. It changes. You know, there was a time where it changed fast. These days, it feels like it's slowed down a little bit, but the changes that are coming uh, are significant. So they're big. Uh, they have implications. 
So it's really, there's a lot of complexities with that and just staying up to date with that. You know, if you don't have a system that can help you navigate that world, you're going to find it very difficult. If you're just relying on a compliance officer to let you know every time something's due and every time something has to be done, you're always going to be under pressure. You're always going to be there because you can't see in advance. You only know when they let you know. So you need a proper system that can really help you navigate these things and think a system that prompts you uh, you know, well in advance and where you can manage and have everything in one place. So that's quite important, right? And, and there's two levels of, of, of compliance in my view. There's client um, compliance. So meaning that if we say client compliance, we're talking about like, oh, I did, like I, I implemented something for them and is all that documentation in place? Is, the, is that advice process compliant? But then there's the business that also needs to be compliant. And there we're not just only talking FSCA, right? We're not talking phase and those kind of things only. There's some requirements there as well. But SARS, CIPC, um, you know, all of these um, kind of things where you need to stay compliant for the business takes a lot more time and a lot more effort. Um, and these are the things where we really need to start, start thinking about. So how can we how can we sort of simplify this? And why is it important to simplify your compliance? And again, uh, there's an article that will be published very shortly uh, in one of the publications where I spoke about 10 things uh, that you should know before you become a financial advisor. And one of the things is that, you know, compliance for me, I have a bit of a different view on that. So the way that I view compliance is that if you look at what they are requiring from you and you use those as best practice guidelines, because that's the whole intention behind regulation is they want to protect the consumer and they want to build, a, they want you to build a sustainable business. So if you see those things suddenly as an asset in your business and you implement things along those lines, for your level of business, and you use technology to help you manage that, then suddenly you're building a, a great business. And then second to that is if you take the compliance and position it as a benefit to the client instead of, a, I'm so sorry for all this paperwork and I'm so sorry for the 10 million uh, attachments to your email and the 20 million signatures that I require, but rather say what they get because they work with someone like you, that makes the world of difference. So by thinking about these things, we can really start simplifying. I think the, the most important thing you can do is to implement some form of an automated tracking system, either a system that prompts you and that reminds you, um, keeps you up to date, a system that is updated automatically with the changes that are coming out so that you are notified timelessly and you have a track record of everything that you've complied with. So it means that you'll have fewer issues fewer complaints, you build a better business, um, and, and that is absolutely uh, crucial. Then technology. How can I not talk about technology and software? I mean, this is where the whole idea started with Simplify is my theme for the year. One of the things that we see is definitely happening is that, so you have something like Microsoft, for example. Most people in this profession is using Microsoft or are using Microsoft. But you have all this functionality, but we never took the time to learn it. So what are we doing? Oh, I want to do this, this thing. But you don't even think that Microsoft can do that. So what do we do? We go and look for a new app. We go and look for a new system. We go and look for all these new things when, in fact, Microsoft was probably able to facilitate that. And here's the other thing, how we think about this. And this is sort of where I'm changing my view a little bit, right? So you would have heard me say a lot in the past that you need to find technology that fits your business and you shouldn't be changing your business to fit the technology. Now. I fully still stand by you don't change your business, but the things that you can change are your processes. So if there are processes that you want to change or workflows that needs to change, because maybe these are all your 10 requirements that you want to see when you are managing a task for a client. You look at what Microsoft Planner can do and it can do six of those things. Yeah, no, I can't use that. Now I go and look for another task management system and my CRM can, can only do eight of the 10 things. So now I'm also looking for something else. Instead of really interrogating whether the thing that you want is really necessary, is it cool for you to know that? Or is, there, is it really like, critically important and valuable for you to know that? Because this is the thing that I've seen on all these forums when people are complaining about things is that, oh, but it can't do this and it can't do that. And I think like, but why do you want to do that? Like, I, I, don't, I don't understand the value, but obviously I, mean, I need to have a conversation with them to understand. But ultimately, for me, it's like, this is what you want to do. What needs to be done? Has anybody started working on it? What's happening while we're working on it? And is it done? It's simple, <laughs> right? And Microsoft facilitates that. It's all part within the license you're already paying for. 
So part of simplifying your tech stacks and things is to use what you already got to its maximum capacity and maximum ability. That's step one. And then to say, well, which of these things don't I really need? And to get rid of those because you're paying unnecessary money for things that you're not using. It doesn't help us paying for tech stacks. My whole business is just running on tech. So I pay a lot of money and I always keep on looking at, do I really need this? Am I still using this? Because even a 500 rand year and a thousand rand there and a 20 rand year makes a difference over the course of a year. So you, you know, we, we have all these wonderful tools, but we use 10% of their capability maybe. That's the thing that you need to, to sort of think about. Right. The other thing that you need to think about when it comes to technology is just to also ask yourself the question, what could I be doing with this piece of technology that I already have? So it's not just about canceling. It is about what can this do for me? And you need to turn it around. Because remember, I always say that technology is not a cost. It's an investment if it is the right technology. But you need to think about it from a business point of view. At the moment, we're thinking it from a work point of view. So we want to use tools that can do something for me. But the question that we don't ask is, how can this tool make me money? What can I do with this tool that I can sell to my client? So that, that's a very different question to, to ask and a very different angle to take on your technology. So there are definitely tools who can do analysis and all sorts of weird and wonderful things, and you can charge clients to do that for them. But we've positioned ourselves as doing these things for free. So now suddenly you feel like this is a cost and I'm paying for something that I'm not getting value, but you could. If you just change that one thing. So I think that's another thing to, to sort of look at. A big part of technology and software for me is automation. <laughs> I'm not going to get into detail. That's a whole episode on its own. But we use automation a lot in my business. Uh, in fact, I would be dead in the water if I didn't. So there's so many more things. And now with Copilot, um, you know, I've, we, we bought, I bought Copilot for my, uh, for my business. It's fantastic, Microsoft Copilot, what you can do. And when we do that session on the ATLC, exactly how these things can really make your and your staff's lives easier. But you've still got to go and look at it and say, is the 7,000 and I'm going to pay a year per user worth it? Am I getting more than that back? And I'm telling you, just in the one thing I did, I'm getting more than that back already. So it's really, really uh, crazy what these tools can do. But you've got to stay ahead of the curve. But think about, do so you want less in your tech stack? But also, how do you? How can I use this to make more money, right? What can I sell that this tool is creating for me or generating for me? Or how can it simplify and automate my process? Those are the kind of questions that you should be asking uh, around those, those things. Then the fifth thing that is really complex, and I think you'll agree with me here, uh, is client communication, right? To communicate with clients, there's so many things. There's marketing. There is check-ins, there is, uh, what else? There is operational things, there is instructional kind of communications. You know, all those, those things are happening. And it's really, really difficult that if you're doing it and somebody in your team is doing it or you have a team of advisors who have to communicate and it's under your brand, how do you keep it consistent? Like you just simply, it's, it's almost like a, a non-starter for, for most people. You know, what are we providing to clients when we onboard them? You know, how do we how do we set the scene? How do we make sure all of these things? And then communication isn't only emails and WhatsApps and those things. What's happening in your meetings? How are we communicating in the meetings with clients? What are we saying? What are, are we giving them time to think? Are we sort of um, looking at, you know, what's in, we focus, are we focusing more on the agenda and what we want out of it? Or are we really interested in the person sitting across from us at the table? So there's a whole lot of things there that, that, is, that is necessary. And if we can simplify the way that we communicate, we simplify our meetings, we simplify the things that we send. So just think about your onboarding email, six to 10 attachments. Do you think that's not overwhelming? It's crazy, right? And the reason why we do this is, one, we don't want to send multiple emails to the client because that's also annoying. And secondly, we want all the information back as quickly as possible so we can do our job. But we don't sit, uh, put ourselves in the shoe of the client always and think about it. Well, what is it like receiving six or 10 attachments, even if I can sign them on quickly sign? Like, what is that experience like? All of that for me falls into client communication. And if you want to build trust, right, you've got to be able to communicate well in all areas of the business. So we've got to think about what do we do? How can we templatize most of these communications, specifically the things that we send to clients and not have a conversation like this? 
But if we send things to clients, how do we structure those? Like, can we have standard things that we send to clients that we then personalize before we send them? But at least the tone, the look and feel, everything is sort of consistent. So it doesn't matter whether Sue or Paul is sending it, it's sort of the same, the same thing. Also, tech can help a lot in communication, but we've got to be, be careful. You've got to use the right tool for the right job. That's absolutely non-negotiable. I think at the end of the day, uh, and I had a very interesting conversation yesterday where somebody was saying that somebody presented something that's their own, couldn't, got somebody else to come and explain, okay, we're going to go ahead and do it. Um, you know, so you might have the most fantastic product, the most fantastic value proposition, the most fantastic service, client experience, everything. But unless we can communicate it well, we're going to feel like things are staying complex and that we can't we can't move move forward. So look at your financial product offerings. You know, don't you have too many? Can you simplify? Can you get most of the people onto one platform? Uh, or at least all your new clients that you take on decide that you're going to do one platform primarily. And unless there's another reason, go to your your, your secondary one. Obviously, risk is a little bit more, more different, a little bit more difficult, uh, not more different. Well, although free state, that's also fine. And um, so think about those things. Those are important. Think about your... How are you going to do a data analysis on you have to do that once this year and i'll i'll really implore you to do it this first quarter do a deep dive analysis of your client base and i'm talking everything i'm going to repeat the stuff so it is the client demographical information basically the stuff that comes from your crm your assets under management which you'll get from the asset providers or if you use seed analytics you can get it from them uh, revenue management right so if you have a breakdown of all of the revenue streams fees included if you're with Comspace, that's not a problem. If you're somewhere else, you might find it more difficult. So, but go have a look at those, right? And then um, think about any other th anything else that's important for you in your business, and overlay all of those, and then have a look at uh, what it is. And uh, you know, if you want to build a good, solid business with a solid revenue stream, you need to think client and not product. So, see what share of wallet have you got with the client? What are they paying you for? Don't think about product. Oh, I need to sell medical aid, or I need to sell risk, or I need to do this to build my income stream. Look at the client and what are their needs, and how can you build a, a revenue stream around them, which may consist of all of these these things. And then, very importantly, how do you leverage technology to its fullest ability? The things you have, why are you not using it? How can you use it? Can it generate additional revenue for you? How will you build something, a product, or something around that offering? And then, how do you, which things will you eliminate, and where can you automate? and all of those good things. Fantastic. That's the end of episode one of season five. Flew by. Uh, thank you very much for joining me. Really appreciate it. Uh, next week, we have our first guest. Please keep an eye on uh, LinkedIn, and uh, we will announce that on Monday, who that is. And uh, we look forward to having you back next week. Uh, new episodes, new, uh, obviously a new guest and new segments and all of that good stuff. But the same amazing experience. So thank you very much for being with us. Uh, we'll be back next week. Same time, same place. Have a great weekend. Stay safe, be blessed and prosper and continue to raise the bar. Love you lots. Bye-bye.